um, we were over here, right? We talked about the RAM and RAM and DRAM. Did we talked about this? I don't think so. No, but we, we, okay, but we talked about sequential access, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's the, that's the, which one's that? The tape. Sequential is the tape. Oh, or the regular one? Sequential is tape as opposed to. Oh, like we're for like backups and stuff. Yeah. But also a disk, the subtle, a subtle point is that the disk is also sequential as opposed to random. It's not such a subtle point. Basically, it, anything that moves, anything that, I mean, the simple rule is that anything that has moving parts is by definition sequential because that means it has to move things around. It, 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 you know, it's not just logic. So therefore it has to, it takes time to get there. The movement takes time. Okay, so we talked about that. Moving parts as in actual physical moving parts? Yes, physical okay. moving parts. If it has physical moving parts, then it has to be sequential. Um, okay, I just want to go over this quickly. This is not that. Um, maybe so will well, CD also be sequential then? Yes, yes, for sure. Okay. Um, okay, uh, Ram, read only memory, access is random, it is written once. It, it is write once memory. That means you write it and that's it. You can't change it. Let me go to a bigger view. Um, did I talk about ROM last time? No. 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 So every computer, I mean, maybe you guys, hopefully you already know what I'm about to say, but every computer has a, um, a program called, well, in, in, a, in a PC, it's called a BIOS and in other architectures, it can be called different things, but, it has some kind of little program which uh, starts the computer. If I t and even if you don't have an operating system, that program will run. And basically, if you think about it, that program is, is, is necessary because how else would the computer ever know where to find the operating system, where on the disk it is? Is it in the beginning of the disk, the end of the disk? And, 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 and is it on the disk at all? Is there an operating system? In other words, there has to be a program that knows how to like kind of get the car going. It's like, it's like um, in those old fashioned cars, you have a old crank in the front that winds it up. You need to start it. And then once it's going, you know, it can generate electricity itself. But you need to, so in a program, you need, in a computer, you need a program to read the first program. So that program is hard coded into the ROM. Can you change only. the ROM? So if you if it if you change it, then it's not regular ROM, then it's a special kind of ROM, which we'll talk about. I'm saying like in regards to like Androids, can't you like flash a new ROM or whatever? Yes, I say, but then it's not regular ROM. Then it's okay. um, but it's like the basic program that just it's there just so the program it might not do much. It might not give you much functionality at all. But it's not, but there needs to be some kind of program there so that things can get started. Um, I wrote here, cannot be altered. Well, that's why it's called read-only memory. It's just for reading, can't be written to. Now, the import, another important parameter is the data will be preserved even without electric current. It is intended to be read-only. Yeah, I don't know why I wrote that again, but. Um, um, just again, why is that, what do you mean by access is random? Access is random, in other words, not sequential. It's a kind of memory, we talked about two kinds of memory, random access and sequential access. So even though it's not called RAM, random access memory, it is a kind of random access memory. It's called read-only memory though, because it's random access, it's not regular memory, it's only for reading. You write it once in the factory and that's it. And an important quality of it is that it's preserved without electric current. Well, that's also necessary because that means if I unplug my computer and I plug it in, I don't want to have lost that program because then I'll never get my operating system up. In that sense, it's like a disk, it's like a hard drive because it's there even when I turn back off the electricity. As opposed to RAM, RAM, random access memory, 
is, is the data is lost as soon as uh, the data is here it says by SRAM the data is preserved as long as there's electric current as soon as I unplug the computer my RAM is wiped out what does RAM stand for random access memory and SRAM is static random access memory now static makes it sound like it's not so good it's like static it's not so as opposed to DRAM, which is dynamic, which makes it sound better. But actually it's the reverse. Static RAM is better because it's, it's, it's static. In other words, the data is preserved better. It's more static. It's more, it doesn't get altered. It doesn't, uh, how do you, I don't know, get um, ruined. We'll see, we'll talk about how DRAM gets ruined. The very, the last slides of, the, of today's, of, the, of this chapter, um talk about that that it gets ruined but sram is is better the uh, it's also random access data is preserved as long as there are, it can be written and read but data is preserved only as long as there's electric current i mean we could add the word only uh it's only preserved as it's a, it's a problem with it it's not like flash your flash drive your, your, your disk on key, what they call in Israel, disk on key or a thumb drive, that is preserved without electricity. You write something there and it stays there. What's that called? Well, that's the next slide. We'll, see, we'll talk about that. That's called, well, that's called flash. Flash. But what would be the difference between flash and disk? Isn't disk the same idea? Flash has no moving parts. Oh, so fla like flash would be like SSD as opposed to disk, which would be like the HHD or... Well, everything is different. Everything is similar and everything is different. There are things that are similar about everything and things that are different. The thing that it's most similar to is the ROM, the flash. It's most like the ROM because you can, because you, it's day, it's memory that doesn't move. So that's like the ROM. And it's memory that uh, you don't need electric current to keep. So that's like the ROM. The only difference between it and the ROM is that the flash you can write to and read to, read from. You can write to and read from, whereas the ROM is only for reading. Big differences between the ROM and the SRAM that this is preserved, pre will be preserved even without electricity. The SRAM will not be preserved without electricity. It's like what, a, that's your, when, when you get a computer that has 16 gigabytes of memory, that's the SRAM or the DRAM. Now, if, if you get a computer that has 16 gigabytes of memory, and you say, great, it's a computer, but how come this one next to it, you ask the salesman, is got only eight gigabytes of memory, it costs twice as much. How could that be? He says to you, oh, because that one's SRAM. He says, well, what's the first one? First one is DRAM. DRAM is cheaper and slower, so you can buy more of it for the same price. So you could have a computer with 16 gigabytes of memory, and it actually will run slower than the computer with eight gigabytes of memory, which is SRAM. So a, a CD and a cassette tape, that would be an example of ROM? No, 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 no. This is all, these are all pieces of plastic that just look like a, a you know, a piece of plastic. They do not look like, they're not big and they're not, they're silicon chips. These are all silicon chips. All so these are specific things. They're not a type of memory. They are a type of memory and they are specific things. Meaning They're, just because the CD fix, fix, uh, fits the um, description of it CD, does not make it wrong. That's right. A CD is something else. A CD is a, is a different kind of, it's a laser disc. It's, got, it's a different type of thing. This is a, these are all silicon discs. Computer have a combination of SRAM and DRAM? Uh, usually, I've never heard of that. It could theoretically. It could theoretically. But it will have a combination of ROM and, and RAM. That for sure. One of these kinds of RAM. Again, there's no such thing as RAM, just like there's no such thing as a dog. There's a poodle and there's a hound and there's a, you know, a schnauzer. But there's no dog. You can't say, I want a dog. It has to be a kind of dog. It could be a mutt. So RAM, there's no such thing as, in a sense, there's no such thing as RAM. There's either SRAM or DRAM. 
I don't know if they make computers with both, but they do, but certainly you have ROM and RAM. DRAM is slower and it's cheaper. It, because this memory is based on capacitors, now you don't probably know what a capacitor is, but it's uh, two pieces of metal that can store electricity. With time, the data gets corrupted despite there being electric current. So this is a key point, that as it differs from SRAM, DRAM essentially does the same thing as SRAM in the sense that I can read to it and I can write from, I can write to it and read from it, both of them, the DRAM and the SRAM. And, and it's fast memory, it's faster than a disk, but, but the DRAM is built on a technology called a capacitor, which is an old technology. And it's uh, more physical kind of, it's, it's, it's clumsy, it's a bit clumsy and it loses electricity, which means that if I remember all of this requires, that both of these require current to be going, but I write, but I don't constantly in a, in, I'm not constantly supplying current to those ones. Like I put, I put a one in there and it, and it stays there. It's like got a little battery. I give it a charge and you know, the ones and the zeros of a, of a particular address. You got a certain address location and I have a byte there, I have eight bits. And those eight bits have ones and zeros. The ones are a certain electrical current and the zeros are a lower electrical current. And, and there's like a battery there holding that current. I don't have to keep on adding new electricity. I just put it there once and it stays there as long as the whole system has electricity. That's what we meant by the system has to have a current. But the thing about DRAM is that even if there's a current in the system, that one that I put there will degrade. It will slowly start losing its, its, its a voltage. It's like a bad battery that doesn't hold its voltage. I charged it, but I'm going to have to recharge it every, you know, every certain period. That's, and that recharging takes time. And that's one of the things that makes the DRAM slower. All right, let's go on. Well, we're going to talk actually the very end. Here, I'll show you just the very end. I have a whole discussion about DRAM and why is information likely to be lost in DRAM and what's to be done about it. That's at the very end. So if, if on your computer it's called RAM, does that mean you don't know if it's SRAM or DRAM? It could be either. Right. If you're a geek, you know. Okay. If you're a computer, if you know about computers, then you'll know whether you have DRAM or SRAM. But if you just are buying a computer and they tell you 16 gigabytes of memory, you say, oh, that's great. And you don't know what you're, you don't know what you're is there, buying. Is there a way to check on a computer once you already bought it? Mm, maybe, I don't know, maybe. Maybe if you look at the name, maybe it'll print some, the name of the memory, something like that. I don't know. Um, I mean, here, let's look at my, let's see. Oh, you won't see my, uh, let's do a different share. Uh, share, share, new share. Uh, screen. Okay. What if I go? Maybe we'll say in, in the task manager, like when it gives all the information about the CPU and the memory. I was thinking different. I was thinking. Um, Device manager. No, I was just thinking like, uh, what if I go? Where's my computer? Where's my computer? Ah, it's here. Um, is it my computer over here? Um, I think I think that was Windows Seven. Here you, you go to settings. Yeah. It's called it's called, it's called about PC. I think. Like, yeah. Then where? Then you you go to system. No, just type in about PC. In the search in the start menu about PC. Then all the way down is about. Get more. Like all oh. the way the la the last one you have to scroll down more. About here, it just says it says installed RAM eight gigabytes. Doesn't tell me what. Um, tells me the speed of the processor. That's we talked about that. But, right, we talked about the speed. How many gigahertz it runs at? Um,
No, it doesn't. It doesn't really know. It's interesting. It doesn't really know. The software doesn't know. You know what I mean? The software doesn't know. From the software's perspective, it's just fine. There should be a way with the device drive. Like there should, I mean, maybe there's like a device driver for the memory. Um, but anyway, okay. Let's go back to here. Um, New share. I'm gonna share like that. Okay. View. Okay. Um, so we also have when we talk about ROM here, we also have EEPROM, which has the word ROM in it, because it's a kind of ROM. And it's special, like I said, that was the most basic ROM we talked about. But there's erasable programmable ROM. Just like ROM, which means it's read only, but it can actually be it can that can be erased by external means. It can be erased by external means using ultraviolet light, and then it could be rewritten. Is it like burning it off? Burning it? Yeah, you put some kind. I don't know exactly how you do it. You there's some program you can use that sort of creates some through of a high voltage or something, create some ultraviolet light, and then you can do this. My I actually- is, is it able to run out at a certain amount of times? Like if it like makes it too thin or something like that? I don't know, I don't know. Then there's EEPROM, which is electrically erasable programmable memory, which is like EEPROM, except you don't have to use ultraviolet light, you can just use electricity. And that's probably what most ROM today is. And that's how you would do something like a BIOS update. You know, that's what's called, there's something called firmware. Because if it's, you know, firmware means that it's, it's like hardware, right? There's hardware and there's software, and then there's in the middle firmware. Because this is basically hardware. Because it's basically like, if it would be ROM, it would actually technically be hardware. Because it's like printed into the chip. It can never be altered. It's got, you know, a certain logic to it. And that's it. Um, but if you can erase it electrically and rewrite it, then it's already not hardware so much. It's more, and it's, it's not software yet. It's not really purely software. So it's called, they call it firmware. So when you talk about a firmware update or something, you're talking about changing your EEPROM. When you, and those kind of things, you know, are almost never done, but sometimes they're done. Especially on like um, something that only has ROM, like there are certain, like a device, some kind of, uh, I don't know, a microphone might have a piece of EEPROM in it that you're never supposed to, you know, it's, it comes with the sound of a little program in the microphone to, I don't know, to change the volume or I don't know what to do, to, to maybe to modify the sounds that come in to get rid of, filter out uh, noise. And that could be updated theoretically, even though it's in ROM. And then if it could be updated, then it would be EEPROM. Flash is what you all know. It's a kind of random access. It's like RAM, because it can be written and writ written to and written and read from. But it's also like ROM because even if you don't give it electricity, the data stays there. Why not? So you could say, well, why not just get rid of everything and just use Flash? Why not use Flash instead of RAM and instead of ROM and instead of everything? And everything would be wonderful. So the answer, the simple answer is, there's a couple answers, but the simplest answer is that Flash is slower. It's slower than ROM or RAM. And we want speed, you know, we, we, we don't, Flash, we think of it as fast, but RAM is even faster and it needs to, it needs to be very fast. It needs to be able to run at 2.4 gigahertz, you know, it needs to be able to write to it very fast. You know, I mean, it needs to be able to write a new piece of information to it every cycle. Um, so flash is not fast enough. Then there's the hard disk, which is serial, as I said, does not require current to maintain the data. In other words, electric current. It's large capacity and slow. It's mechanical and therefore subject to breakage, right? It can, it can, can break. Like anything old hard drive? What? It's like old hard drives? No, this is every, this is new hard drive. I don't mean by old, but like. Like a SSD would be a hard disk? No. When you say 
Oh, you, they do have now what's called solid state disks. And that's like that's flash? SS, that's SSD. I didn't talk and about that. Right. And that's what? like flash? That works like flash or like hard disk? That's flash. It's essentially flash. The hard disk is like the old type of hard drive. Yeah. Okay. You want to call it old? Fine. Yeah, it's old. But so my brand new, my computer that I just bought has a hard drive in it. Well, yeah, I mean, for external hard drives. I mean, but it, no, it could be internal or external, doesn't matter. It's still a hard drive. Yeah. Um, but so, serial access, when you say that, you mean that it's like, um, like it has to go in order? No, the definition of serial access is that the amount of time it takes to access a data that is dependent on what data was previously accessed. That is the definition. You can still spin the disk and get anywhere you want. You don't have to read one after the other. But because you have to spin the disk, it may take you more time if you have to spin the disk further. You know, how far you have to turn the disk to get where you want to go. Any time that the time of access is dependent on the location of the data, then it's called serial access. An external hard drive, there's like a little disk going around? Yes, there is. Okay. Little disc going around. And there's reading, there's heads that read the disc. It's a magnetic, it's essentially a, mag, it's a magnetic disc. These are not magnetic. Flash is not magnetic. I think if you would, I mean, I never tried this, but if you take a powerful magnet to a flash drive, it'll be fine, I, I assume. I'm not sure, but I assume. Whereas a hard drive for sure will be destroyed. Okay. Um, That's why you're what? You're not supposed to have magnets near your computer, but it can. It could also on a magnet near the screen also could ruin it. No, or is that is it only an issue? I didn't hear everything you said, but a magnet can ruin a hard drive. Yes, but it has to be a pretty powerful magnet. In fact, I've done it. I've intent. You know, when you throw away your hard drive, you don't want somebody to pick it out of the garbage and read all your data. And if you just delete your files, they're actually still there. Well, you'll learn about a court, you'll learn, oh, I don't know if you will, but in, in there's a course called operating systems where they, hopefully they teach you about files and there's something called a fat file allocation table. And in that is where you tell the computer, where the computer keeps track of where every single file is. And when you delete something, all you do is remove its entry from the, from the table. You don't actually go and put out a zero in every single, uh, byte, you know, every single bit. So if you really want to wipe out your hard drive, you, there's two, you can either take a very powerful magnet and, and, and destroy it, or you could, um, would it be usable after that? It would be usable, but it wouldn't have your data. If it wasn't broken, I'm saying if a working hard drive, you want to throw it away. But before you throw it away, you don't want anyone to be able to get your data. So you put a magnet on it. The other thing you could do is like, there are special programs that, that you can, that are designed to write ones to every single location in your disk. So for, for SSD, that's the only option that would actually be relevant. Yeah. For SSD, but you'd have to do that. Or you could, I think, or you could like, I mean, obviously in both cases, you could like, take a hammer and smash them. You know? but for, so for a non SSD hard drive, if you take a magnet while it, it, on a working hard drive and you use like a very strong magnet, would that erase it and still allow you to use it? Like, will it like reset it completely? Again, everything I said is about a hard drive, about a SSD hard drive. No, I don't think so. SSD hard drives are working different like, principles. This won't like mess it. But like for a regular hard drive, it won't mess up like the program files that allow it to work or something like that. Right. They won't mess up. Exactly. That's the whole point. It won't mess up the, the, the hard drive. What allows it to work? Where is that written? What you just said. There's a little program in the hard drive also. That's written in ROM. That There's a little a bit ROM. of ROM in the hard drive in order to get the hard drive to work. And that won't be but affected what, by the magnet. Because the ROM doesn't use magnet. That's what I'm saying. Uh, you can check. You can Google it and see if I'm right. Uh, parameters to uh, per parameters to characterize memory systems. So there's two basic parameters that we talk about for memory. One is capacity and one is access time. 
how big is it and how fast is it access time is how fast is it so access time is actually a little bit complicated because it's defined differently for different systems uh, for random access systems like ram or rom or flash the time it takes the access time is defined as the time this let's call this a memory address register sorry the and and let's call this the memory information register in other words this i put the address here i go to the memory and the content of that address comes out into this register so that takes a certain amount of time and then i need to read this register then i need to put a new address here get a new memory and a new one comes here so we define the access time as the time from when the address is supplied to the memory um, address register until we can access it in the mirror because it takes the, the memory information register. It takes a certain amount of time for that to happen. And we'll call that the access time. How long does it take from when I give it the address till I get my memory? That's not, that's not going to be the same for sequential non-random access or sequential memory systems um for example the hard drive they have a different definition because the disk is very slow the processor does not directly access it the cpu is like is like a frenetic you know chicken running around it's very fast it can't sit in one spot and wait to to read from this very slow thing called the hard drive so there is a disk controller which mediates between the disk and the processor. He like he just sits there and waits for the disk to read, and then he got the data, and then he says, "Okay, CPU, I'm ready." And CPU runs into the room, grabs the data, and runs out. This allows the processor to interact with the controller at a fast rate, while the controller can govern the slow search for the data on the hard drive. So we've got a mediator in between the fast CPU and the slow disk, and that's called the uh, controller, the disk controller. So now how are we going to define access time? So in this circumstance, access time is defined as the time between the processor requesting the data from the controller, right? He only talks to the controller. He never talks directly to the disk. And the controller giving him the data that he asked for. Well, that makes sense, except we're going to do one more thing not including the time it takes the controller to search the disk, just including the time to actually read the data. In other words, I may be at you know a certain place on the disk and I've got to turn the disk a half a revolution to get to the other side of the disk to get to read the data. Now, I'm not going to count the time it takes to turn the disk a half a revolution to get to the other side of the disk to get to the data. What I am going to count is the time once I'm there to then read that data. So, so I'm going to take the time from when I asked the time I got it, but then I'm going to subtract the search time. This is because search time in sequential data will not be constant. It depends how far away the data is. If I didn't have to turn a half a revolution, I had to turn only a quarter revolution, then that will take less time. And I want to calculate like one number for this hard drive. I want to say, what's the access time of this hard drive, period. I don't want to have, oh, well, it depends on how far. I just want to know when I'm buying it in the store. I just want to know what's its access time. Well, I have to calculate the access time independent of variables that are constantly changing, like how far I need to turn the particular uh, di the disk to get the particular data. So why don't we do a worst case and best case scenario? We could, but instead we just take it out of the equation. You're right, we could do that. <clears throat> we could take the average of the worst and the best case. But what they do is they just take that variable out and they say, how much time does it take? But therefore, it doesn't take into account the speed at which the disk turns. I mean, I think it's still true that there, there are two speeds for disks. I think one is like 5,600 5, revolutions a second. And the other is 7,200 revolutions a second. And a faster, the faster one, those faster revolutions per day are much more expensive, those disks. Even though they're only 50% faster, they're much more expensive. And they're much faster. 
you know, people don't you think about hard drives so much anymore, but uh, they still use them. Anyway, uh, okay, we talked about two things, capacity and access time. Now we'll talk about data rate. Data rate is usually uh, refers to disks, oh, sorry, not to disks, to, to tapes. For example, I'm doing a backup. Now, the interesting thing about a backup is if I'm backing up a disk, that means like I working at a big company and they have a lot of disks and, and every week they back up all the data in cases of fire and all the disks get you know, destroyed. And they keep all those backup tapes in you know, fireproof safe. And they never use them. But if there would be a fire, they would have those backups. Now, when you do a backup, you take your disk and you write every single thing that's on it into the tape. You don't like jump around. You just write from byte from address zero until address four, you know, trillion. So you just want to. So it's essentially you're doing sequential reading. So basically, what you do is you take a, a tape is actually ideal for that. I'll just read the things from the disk, and I'll write them to a tape. I'll set the tape spinning very fast, and the head will just write all the data directly to the tape. And when I ever want to copy it back, I'll just copy it back in reverse order. You know, I'll just or I'll start again at the beginning of the tape and go again. So tape drives are actually very useful for backups. And in tape drives, we measure the speed at which the tape drive can write. And we call that bits per second, BPS. Um, so that's just how many bits it can. Notice it's bits, and I'm pretty sure it's bits and not bytes per second. It's bits per second. There's a very basic unit. Um, in other words, we just want to know how many bits it can write per second, each one and zero, how many can it do per second? So that's like if you're buying a, a tape backup, you know, how many bits, you know, let me see. Let's just, for the sake of curiosity, let's see if I go to um, Amazon. Amazon. And I do, um, Tape backup drive. Let's see. Here. See, you can still buy them. Two thousand dollars. Now it says see it's also capacity, six terabytes of capacity. But what's the bit rate? Does it tell me? Four hundred megabytes per second. Where do you see that? Uh, second to last line. Yeah, uh, down there. Nope. Yeah. Four hundred. Oh, four hundred oh, 400 megabytes a second. Capable of transfer data rates. Data transfer is up to four hundred mega. Well, is that megabytes or megabits? It's not. You know, it might be megabits. Um. It. You, there's a reason. What? Well, I mean, a byte nowadays. People refer, to, people refer to things as megabits. There is when you talk about uh, network capacity, you always refer to it in bits, because in networks there's no concept of a byte. Because it, well, I don't know if you'll learn about this, but there's um, I'm just seeing. Yeah, in in networks you talk about bits, for example. It could be bytes. It could be bytes. You know, it doesn't really matter. If it was um, bits. If, if it was bits, then it wouldn't be worth, like no one would actually buy that for $2,000 nowadays because Why? Like, 400 megabits wouldn't be so fast compared to like uh, hard drives that you could get for like a lot cheaper. Yeah, how much are hard, how fast are hard drives? Well, let's, I know just like memory cards that I use for photography, you could get like 100 megabytes per second and they're like significantly cheaper for like half a terabyte even. Uh huh. Okay, so there you go. So, so, I, so I take your word for it. It's uh, megabit, megabytes. But it could be, I'm just saying theoretically it could be bits. But um, I wrote bits in my thing. But anyway, yeah, so you do see that they still exist and that they're faster than, than uh, hard drives. Um, okay, but you're, so you're saying maybe it's, well, it used to be bits, put it that way. Um, you can check that. But uh, I'm pretty sure it doesn't really matter. 
there's a reason why it should be bits because the concept of a byte is already a less basic concept. Like you don't have to, a byte could theoretically be 10 bits. There actually was an ASCII version, for example, uh, that was not eight bits. There was an ASCII encoding that was six bits because for, it used to be that networks were slow and they figured they only need six bits for ASCII. So they made a, a six bit byte. It doesn't exist anymore, but there was. So when you're talking about network communication, really just interested in bits, how many bits are going through. Also, when you send a byte, let's say you send a word on the network, you put a few, you put some bits before, you put like a checksum at the end. I don't know if you learned about this, but you put a checksum. You, you count up all the ones, for example, and you see how many ones are there in the, in the number, and then you put that number at the end. So you add, so for every byte, there's a certain overhead of extra data to guarantee that there weren't corruptions along the way. So you, when you measure the speed, you're really interested in the, you know, you, the user is interested in the bytes that get to him, but the network is interested in bits because the network has no idea how much, what system you're using. When you send your data, you know, Twitter could use one, you know, uh, sorry, the Twitter is about to TCP IP could use one system, but some other communication protocol could have a different amount of uh, overhead on each spike. So therefore, if we want to compare apples to apples, we can only compare bits. Anyway, if, if what I said you don't un you understand, good. If what I said you don't, I don't, you didn't understand, doesn't matter. Either you learn it in another class or you won't. Uh, in, in, short, in, in communications, anyway. Cycle time. Uh, minimal time that the processor must wait between the start of two consecutive memory accesses. So this is very interesting. Cycle time is a little bit different from access time. We learned what access time was, which is like the time from when I asked for it till I get it here. But cycle time, well, cycle time is that same cycle that we talked about when we said our computer runs at four gigahertz, four gigabytes a second, sorry, four gigahertz, which means four uh, billion clock cycles a second. Well, how do we decide that number? How do we decide that our computer, why don't we make it like 16 gigahertz? Why should we make it four? Let's make our computer run even faster. Let's make the cycles really fast and do everything faster. So the answer is we can only run our clock speed as fast as the slowest operation that we need to do is. Because we have to make sure that in one cycle, we finish one operation. And one operation is, for example, a memory read. I'm not talking about the command load word. I'm not talking about a command that does memory read because that has other things in it. It also increments the PC. It also has, I'm just talking the actual reading from the memory, that actual step, which is in one cycle. That has to, that's, I ask for the memory, I get the memory. It takes one cycle. If it, this is the slowest action that I'll ever do in a computer. In other words, reading from a register will be faster. Reading from the register file or doing an ALU operation will be faster. But reading from memory is always going to be slow. So this action will be the slowest thing I'll ever do. And, so, and writing from memory? And writing from memory. So therefore, I will determine the speed at which I can run my, my clock based on the length that this takes. But not just that length. It's the access time and also a certain thing called dead time. Now, what is dead time? Dead time is two more things added, recovery time and transient time. What are those? Transient time is the time needed for the data to be electrically stable, which means that the data got to the register, but it's not yet stable. It's still going up and down, up and down a little bit. It's like, it's like if you pour water into a cup, it takes a few seconds for the water to stop shaking and for it to reach the level that it's supposed to. Same with electricity. When you put electricity into a, a, you know, into a certain uh, bit, it'll first, it might have too much at the beginning, it might have too little, and then it stabilizes. The second thing is this recovery time, which we're going to talk about when we talk about DRAM. This is only relevant really for DRAM, but recovery time is that I need to, when I read from DRAM, I actually destroy the data that was in the DRAM. I, it's true, I get the data, I find out the values into my register, and I read from the DRAM into my register. The register now has the value, but the electric current that was in the DRAM is now gone. 
So I have to have a special piece of hardware that's going to rewrite to the DRAM the memory that I just read from it, the exact ones and zeros. Is that why it becomes worse over time? No, that's that helps prevent it from becoming that that deals with the fact. I mean, yeah, I mean it's related to it. Yes, it also gets worse over time even if I don't read it. But if I do read it, I totally wipe it out. And therefore, I need to rewrite it. So that also slows me down. So if I've got DRAM, every single memory read, my, the cycle of my, as if I got DRAM, my cycles are going to be slower. OK, so cycle time. Ah, so here, I just explained that. What I just told you, I just explained from here in words that um, the RF, for example, is fast. But the memory is slow, and therefore it will determine um, it will determine the cycle time. And the cycle time is the access time plus the recovery and the transient, just like we saw in the previous slide. Okay, now we're going to go into SRAM and DRAM. So first of all, let's understand this certain uh, diagram here. This diagram is showing two logic gates, and they're connected. You've never seen anything like this before, where you you just directly connect the output of two lines into one line. It's like a circle here, really. And these become the same one line. So if this is a one bit and this is one bit, this is also one bit. Now this, the reason you've never seen this before is because this is a horrible idea to do. This is, C will be undefined. It's like, you can't do this. You're not allowed to do this because if this is a one and this is a zero, well, what's this gonna be? It's gonna be a extra one, I don't know. You'll never know what this, You'll Whatever, this is not, um, could be this is a one, this is a one, you'll get too much electricity here. Or it could be this is a zero and this is a zero, but each zero actually has a little bit of electricity. It could be together, they become a one. So you can't do this. It's illegal. Why would we want to do it? Well, we'll see. But just keep that in mind, you can't do it. We're going to show you now a way to, to do this. Why we want to do it, you'll have to wait for the next couple of slides. But, but, um, Let's just say this is illegal, and now we'll see how you can actually do it. So we have a thing called a tri-state component, which essentially look is like a switch that can, you know, when you, when you turn a switch on the door, when you come into the room and you want the light to go on, you essentially move a wire down and physically down, and now the connection is made and the light goes on. And when you turn the switch the other way, the wire goes up and it's disconnected. Now, a tri-state has got a similar kind of thing but it's it's not actually physically moving. There's nothing, no moving parts. Even though I drew it like this, nothing is actually moving. You've got this line here, which is a control line, which is essentially enable. When enable is zero, it's disconnected. It's not enabled. And when enable is one, then it's connected and electricity goes through. The way this is achieved is by having a, Something called like a um, something something that creates high impedance. Impedance just means that electricity can't get through. We sort of like build a dam here, and there's a certain this is the transistor basically. You you have a certain way of uh, removing that dam or or not removing that dam. So now that's all it is. So basically, this input will be a one, then the output will be a one. This input will be a zero, the output will be a zero. Unless the enable is zero, in which case the output will be um, disconnected. I won't even call it zero, I'll call it disconnected. It's just physically like that, disconnected. Doesn't matter what the input is, this output. So we can say it's tri-state because this line can either have one or zero or disconnect which I called here inactive. So that's three states, zero, one, and disconnect. So now let's use a tri-state and we can say like this, this is similar to the picture we had before, we're creating what's called a bus, which is a way to bring data, you know, like a bus brings people, we wanna bring all this data over to here. But we, if we wouldn't, if we wouldn't have a tri-state here and, uh, I mean, what's missing from this picture actually is like a line over here of the data coming in. The data is coming into this tri-state number one and going out. Data is coming into tri-state number two and going out. 
coming in and going out. Now, what would be for, in this case, we are allowed to do this under one condition, that only one of these enable lines is actually enabling. So this one will be zero, this one will be zero, this will be disconnected. This will be disconnected. If it, it's like, it's like, it's essentially physically disconnected, except not, nothing moves. Wait, shouldn't it have a zero, not disconnect? Where there's no disconnect, there's no zero. I don't, what do you mean? Isn't this like a mux? It's similar to a mux, but it's, a mux it's works with, a mux works with ands. A mux work with and, logic gates. This is working with a tri-state. It achieves pretty much the same result. Is why, why can't we just use logic gates instead of a tri-state? Like what, what do we end up with differently here than if we'd used and or gates? Um, well, let's say like this, they're cheaper. Let's say like that. But you're right, you could have an and, well, because I'll tell you what we different. I'll tell you what we different. That's what I was saying. It's a tri-state. I'll give you a better example, better reason. Because even a zero over here, in other words, you're saying just use an and over here and put a zero on this line. And then whatever comes in here, it'll be a zero on this line. That's what you had just asked. And I started off by saying that's illegal. This is illegal. Even if there's a zero coming in here and it's an and gate. This is an or gate. But even if this is a zero here and it's an and gate, it's still illegal to combine two outputs into one line. I'm saying put a gate by wherever A and B are combined. Yeah, put, but an or gate. put an OR gate to connect. Yeah. You can put either, depending on what you want to do, either an OR gate or AND yeah, gate that, right on that point. Like how, how, what are we getting here? The tri-state way, what are we getting differently than if we'd put in a gate there? Well, I was just saying, what about a gate over here? Here's over here. Put this gate. I have two no, lines coming. But then you legally can't combine them. But I'm saying if you put a gate. No, I'm combining. Gonna... I'm combining. You, you want to draw a diagram. All right. Let's here. Where is my. Where's the whiteboard? Oh, I got to do share. Stop share. Actually, I have a better way of doing it, but all right. Uh, you're saying like this, have A and have B, and put an, um, put an, uh, put an OR gate, I don't know. Well, it depends what we're trying to do, but yeah, either an OR or an AND gate, depending on what our purpose is. And now, now it's legal here, to combine. And now here we have uh, some kind of gate over here. And if two here. Yeah, and those those okay, the last line all the way to the right, that would be C. And the two lines before that would be A and B. You could do that. Um, but let's say you had another one here. So you put it into an end gate. We, we learned that you could put more than one into a gate. Yeah, but on the inside, it's, it's uh, you build it out of many gates. No? In order to do this, you'll have to do like this. Now you'll have to, do, you? the, you'll have to do this. You'll have to do this. You know, this is an or, let's say that's an or. And then you have to do again this. And, you know, you'll have to do this. You're, you're saying what, that and if I would have, them. if I would have, uh, wait a second, if I would have 4 billion of these, because I have 4 billion bytes, you know, in my computer, because it's a four gigabyte computer. If I had 4 billion of these, I'd have a heck of a lot of gates here because it would just, it would start being exponential, right? I would, the, the pyramid would get much bigger. I'd have a lot, a lot of OR gates. So you're saying that when we actually were taught that you could put more than one thing to the same gate, and actually we were just doing that for lessons, but when you actually build it, it's really using multiple gates to solve that? Yes. 
Why can't we just have one big mux and a control? Because the bit? mux, uh, because the mux would look like this. That's exactly the point. There's no way around it. The There's mux the is mux not magic. The mux is not magic. You got to build the mux out of gates, and it's going to look like this. It's going to be a pyramid. It's going to get really big, and it's going to be expensive and big, and slow. Slow. Think the word slow. Slow is our enemy. So instead, what we do, I'm saying you're right for two, it could be, it could work. But for a four billion, it's not going to be so good. So the way we do it is we just do them all in a line here. I mean, I don't, look, look, just suffice to say, understand that if on the exam they ask you something about a tri-state, you know what it is. Exactly what the, in other words, we can think about it more. We can, I can, I can uh, give you a homework assignment to research about why it's advantage. I'm sure you can Google it and try to figure out, but um, there are some advantages to it. And just, let's just understand the concept. The concept is that uh, I disenable it. And so it's not even connected anymore. So, because remember, if I would just put a zero out on this line and a zero out on this line and a zero out on this line, they'd all combine. A zero is defined. Wait, where did I? I think, uh, just a second. Yeah, look here. One is usually defined as below 0.4 volts. Sorry, zero. Oh, one. What did I write? Was that a mistake? That's a mistake there. Ooh, good, I caught that. Getting a lot of mistakes here. View. Zero is usually defined as below 0.4 volts. And one is defined as above 0.7 volts. Notice it's like a no man's land in the middle, which we, we do to keep, to make sure that, because because we want to make sure that the volt is really 0.4. So it could be like 0.413, and it would still be called zero. As it gets to be 0.5, then we don't know what it is anymore. But everything below 0.4 is, is well, if I, 4.3 is very bad, whatever, there's a gap. We leave a gap for a safety zone. But, all right, Misha, you can't come in here. Okay, anyway, and one is usually defined as above 0.7 or above 0 0.1, 0 0.2, different, different standards for how much it is. But if I put the zeros all on the same line, zero and zero and zero, and I combine them, I'm gonna get four and four and four, I'm gonna all of a sudden get one. I'm gonna get seven, I'm gonna get 12 volts. I mean, 1.2 volts. And it all of a sudden thinks it's a one and it's really three zeros. So I can't even, uh, uh, I can't even put the zeros together. So that's why I'm saying over here that this is not zero over here when I disenable it. It's disconnect. It's as though there's a break in this line here. It's not there at all. And how do I do that? I put something that has a high impedance here. After class, look up what impedance is. But impedance is basically making a, a break here. That will be a complete zero, meaning there won't be any electricity whatsoever coming because of the block. Exactly. It won't be the, right, exactly. It won't allow any electricity there. Wait, why is it like not the allowing same anything? Way, gonna, the same way that a break below would. What? It's going to be something below 0.4, right? Yeah, not just below 0.4, it'll be complete zero. Wait, it would, even if I add them together, I won't get anything. Because if it's point, you know, zero 0.5, if I get enough of them, I'll then eventually I'll get a one. I know, I know, I understand that, but how, how, does, how does it make it as complete zero? Look up so impedance. Look up impedance. The component it cuts off the the circuit. It essentially you, makes a break here by adding some very high impedance over here. It works with. You can learn about it. Look it up. You know, it's basically how a transistor works. It, it it deals with electrons. It's a complicated thing, and that's what somebody got the Nobel Prize for making in the '60s. Well, the transistor. I think it's the same as a transistor. Um, but what you need to know is that it's like it's broken here when this is disabled. And understand that it has to be that way, because if it would actually be connected, even a zero would be a problem. 
Okay, let's go on. So now we want to talk about the main topic of the chapter, which is um, okay. Well, first we are we're still not there yet. Uh, memory size is two mn. Right. This is pretty should be obvious to you when you see this two mn because n here is how much data comes out. For example, if every address is referring to a byte, then how much data comes out when I give it an address? One byte. That's what the memory does. I give it an address, it gives you that byte. Um, so if I have 4 billion, and if, if the address space is like, sorry, is 32 bits, then it's two to the 32 different possible addresses. But each of those contains a byte. So it's two to the 32 times n, whatever the data is. Theoretically, these addresses could be addresses of, uh, I could have an address for every four bytes or every 16 bytes. And then the memory would have to spit out 16 bytes every time. I could build something like that, but then I would have no way of accessing, you know, in memory, I would have no way of saying, well, give me just four bytes. It would always give me 16 bytes and the map. In other words, whatever, whatever I'm addressing here, if I ask myself, what am I giving an address to? Well, am I giving an address to a byte or to four bytes or to eight bytes? If I'm giving an address to four bytes, I'm sorry, to one byte, then that means that what's coming out is a byte. We're going to see an example where he gives an address to every two bits. So then what comes out will be two bits. So whatever n is. Well, can you, just is, take, can you just take what's coming out of data and just split it and take what you want from it? Yeah, once you took it out, you put it into a register. Now you can put, you can shift it right, shift it left. You can do whatever you want to it. But that's not a problem. But you could build a computer, theoretically, that every time you gave it an address, it didn't give you a byte. It gave you 100 bytes. Then you would have an address space that would be, you'd have, you'd have more, your M could be smaller. You could have fewer bits here. And you'd still have a lot of memory. So memory size is two to the M times N, where N, two to the M is the number of addresses and N is the size of this data. Is it eight bytes, how many, eight bits or what? Now we have to explain these three lines. I think we actually talked about it a little bit. This is chip set. This basically makes the size, whether this is active or not active. R write enable means, is it, can I write to it? And read enable means, can I read from it? Obviously one of these will be lit and the other won't be. And chipset basically turns the whole block of, let's say this is a gigabyte of memory, it turns the whole block off. So even if I try to read something, nothing will come out. That's chipset. Um, and if you notice there's a root, there's a line over them, and he, it, it, I call it a roof or, I don't know, up, I don't know what you call it, but it's got a, a roof on top of it. That means that it's active low, and we talked about that that it's active low means that normally, act, if you want to select this one, you put a one here and say, I'm selecting this one. And a zero means that I'm not selecting. But it's going to be the opposite. I'm going to do a chip select of zero means I do want it. And write of zero means I want to write. And read of one means I don't want to read. So for example, when chip select and read are both set to zero, that means that's what I want to do. I want to read. Then and write is to one, then I'm gonna read. When chip select and write are and write are zero, then I'm writing. Notice the chip select always has to be set because we're gonna see in the next slides that you can combine these and then you have to choose one of them, which one you want. So we'll see. So first, before we get there, we have this. We have first two, two concepts called one D, D stands for dimension one-dimensional organization of RAM, of SRAM. We're talking about SRAM here, but I mean, what, what we're saying here is more or less true for DRAM also, just that DRAM will be a little bit more complicated because it has to refresh the data. But let's just say that this is, you could say it's RAM or you could say it's SRAM, but let's call it SRAM because that's what he called it. Um, M is the memory space in bits. So ours are M. And so let's say 32 bits, and we put it into a decoder. Now, if there's 32 bits here, 
how many lines are coming out over here? Or I'll, no, I'll ask a different question. If I light up, let's say one zero one zero one zero on these thirty-two bits, thirty-two lines, how many lines over here will be lit up as a one? So I'm just asking you basically how a decoder works. I've got 31 entrance lines over here and I've chosen a certain number, 342. What's gonna be lit up over here? Nobody remembers? Are you, you're able to repeat the question? What? Uh, repeat it uh, for the third time. If I choose a certain number here, 243, so as I do like one zero one one zero one 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 some number here, like 243, how many lines over here will be, have a one on them? Isn't it just one of them? Just one of them, just one of them. That's what I want you to understand. So I'm essentially choosing. I'm saying, I want line 345. So it's gonna be over here. With these 31, 32 bits, I can choose 4 billion possible lines. And there'll be 4 billion lines over here. And only one of them will get lit up. That's what the decoder does. Is the decoder using a bus or is it using gates? Oh, so the decoder is the, the line inside the decoder is connected to an AND gate for that memory location. And this requires two to the M AND gates. I'm going to have 4 billion ANDs in here. What, what, what is this part? What is this piece doing exactly? I didn't quite, I wasn't able to understand that. Basically, this is the memory over here. I didn't explain fully, but this the, is the, the memory. SRAM. This is the SRAM, and this is the uh, this is the this is the address generator. In other words, I put an address here, and it chooses one line over here, and it goes over here and lights up that line, that row. This is of size n. Now, is that byte? If assuming that n is eight bits, so it lights up that byte, and then that byte n n bits comes out of the data. In other words, I light up which one I want based on what I gave it. This is how memory works. And we're describing now how memory on your computer work. So why do we need the decoder? Why can't we do it directly? Because I need to convert these ones and zeros into a particular line of the four billion lines that are in my memory and say, which of those four billion lines do I want? Yeah, but isn't that written in zeros and ones anyhow? No. The address, there's no addresses here. There's just, this is a byte, there's a byte, a byte, a byte, a byte, a byte, a byte. But I've got a logic gate that's gonna, I got a line here that's gonna come out and connect to a logic gate or some, some kind of logic and tell it, in here there'll be buses probably. But in here, I'm gonna tell it, you know, this line actually, this line in here will be a, a enable, a, a tri-state. there's, I'll have a tri-state over here. All these bytes will be connected to this output line here. Every single one of these 4 billion ones will be coming into a bus. There'll be a vertical line over here. Here, let me use an Epic pen. Uh, Now I got to change my shares. Now this, never, did any of your other teachers use something like this? Um, Where I don't actually go to a whiteboard. I actually just draw right here. Data structure if you like doing that. Yeah, well, it's pretty good. He uses this Epic Pen or he uses something else? No, I think he uses it. I think Zoom has something. Uh, they can draw on the slides? I think so. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. I did use that Annotate. one. Annotate. Yeah, yeah, I did have that. Okay, but I'm using a different tool. Uh, there's a line here. Here's the bus. The bus, and it comes out over to this. I don't have a mouse. It comes out over there. And at each one of these, is going to this bus. Each byte is going to this bus. Okay. Each byte of uh, instruction? 
there's four billion bytes here. That's my memory. My memory. You went to the store and you bought a computer with four gigabytes. You've got four billion bytes here. True? Agreed? Yeah. That's four billion bytes. Each of those bytes, this line here represents the eight bits. This line is, a, let's draw a slash here and write an eight. Yeah, that's eight. Those are the lines of that bit, of that byte. That byte is coming out and connecting to this bus and coming out here. Now, the only problem is that I can't, it's illegal. I have a bus here, it's illegal. Uh, it great, I have to have, so what do I do? I stick in over here, a tri-state. And I make them all cut off, except for one. Which one? The line that comes over here is gonna be the enable here. Every single one has got an enable, such that actually all of them will be zero, let's say, all of them will be off, uh, and, and one of them will be on. So it'll be from the perspective of that bike, he gets onto the highway and he's the only car on the road. And he drives all the way down and he comes out because all the other ones are cut off. The decoder is like the controller for the, the decoder has to select device. the decoder turns 32 a 32 bit address into a single line of four billion possibilities which i need i need that i can't do it any other way they can make decoders that fancy so this decoder remember i drew those pyramids before I showed you how the land gates would get very big. This decoder would be enormous. And wait, so this only releases one byte. So this is something it's done in a cycle and releases it like one byte at a time? Yes, this is one, in one cycle, I put the address here and out of here comes the result. Just if we could go over that middle state again, I'm still having a little bit of trouble understanding it. So it takes in the address and it converts it. If, for example, if I put in 32 zeros here, then the first line here, which is line zero, will get a one on it. Every other line until two to the M minus one, which is four billion, will have a zero on it. Only this line will have a one. Since that line has a one, that, uh, that, in the, that tri-state will be, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's a tri-state. Let's just say it's a tri-state. I'm not, don't quote me on that. But Wouldn't let's it say it's a tri-state. That tri-state will be, why not? It should be a tri-state. That tri-state will be, uh, it could theoretically be if some AND gates. I mean, could, it could do it other way. Yeah, could let's, it be like an AND or like, or a multiplexer kind of thing? I guess yeah, it could be. It could be a logic. It could be logic. Just an AND gate. It could be an AND gate, but an AND gate with eight entrances, because I got eight to go down here. It could, but let's just, I'm just using something that we learned before, but it doesn't have to be that way. But let's say this is what enables that tri-state. And then that output of that byte will be permitted to run down the highway, the bus, and get them out here. Everybody else will have his tri-state turned off. Okay. It should be clear. I think that's pretty clear. We'll see another example and we'll get even more clear. Okay. Um, so that's 1D because it's one dimension. This is just the line goes in. I choose, line goes out, I select. Now we're gonna talk about two dimensional. And I have Paul here an explanation of it all, but I'm just gonna explain it to you um, the, from the picture, I think it's easier. So I can take that same M addresses and I can take the same M addresses and I can divide into two sections. These are just arbitrary sections. And I can say, for example, that Actually, let's let's divide it. Let's say that this is two bits over here, just two bits, and this will be m j will be m minus two. 
As if M is 32, then this will be from zero, you know, from zero to uh, 29. And then I'll have 30 and 31 over here, two bits. So, okay. So how big is our decoder now? It's no longer got 32 entrances. It's only got 30 entrances. So it's no longer, so it's, it's, it's only to J minus one. If it's 30, then it's 29, so J minus one. So it's how much smaller than the decoder was before? In other words, I said there were 4 billion lines here. How many lines are there now? Come on, put on your thinking caps. Well, it's two to the J. J is two to the 30th. How much less is two to the 30th than two to the 32nd? Well, if it was, it's, this is two, this is, this is two to this, this is two squared. So that's four. So it's a fourth. So if it was 4 billion before, now it's 1 billion. We just saved 3 billion logic gates, at least. That's good. So you're gonna ask, okay, that sounds like we just saved 3 billion. So it's only a quarter of what it was before. That's Doesn't great. Mean it also only access less addresses? No, so we're gonna still address the same amount and I'll show you how. But first of all, the decoder is a lot smaller. You can say, well, it's still in the, it's still a billion. Fine, but I, I just took this, I took the simplest example where K is only two bits. K could be eight bits. K could be 16. Half of it could be K and half of it could be J. Then the decoder would all of a sudden get a lot smaller. But let's just say it's two. So I have changes to one billion. But now look what I've got. Segment, segment, segment. Now I'm going to need actually, if there's, I'm gonna if I if I want to have the same amount of memory, each segment here is going to be only how many addresses? One billion. So that means there's one billion bytes here, one billion bytes here, one billion bytes here. How many more segments do I need to get four billion? These are one simple more. questions. One more. One more. Thank you. So I have another segment here. By the way, this is a mistake in the picture. It should be three, not S. So this will be this will be segment four. And these lines, what happens is like this. I choose, let's say, address number zero. So what's gonna happen is the decoder says, oh, zero, light up this line. This line is going to come to this segment, this billion, this billion, this billion, and this billion. So now, from the perspective of this piece of memory here, he doesn't know about the existence of everybody else. He just thinks, oh, I've got a request for the first byte to be sent down the bus. It's going to come down, come out, and a byte will come down. Boom, hit this line here. This guy also gets a request for zero. So he sends his out, boom. He sends his out, boom. He sends his out, boom. I've got four different bytes. This is n. n is how big the word length is. So it's, let's say eight. So it's a byte. So four bytes are, are coming down on these lines. But I only want one byte. So then I use the k, which is, let's say, could be, let's say, zero, one. It's two bits. If I took two bits off here. I'm left with two bits for the k. So if it's zero, one, what's value is uh, zero, one is two. So it's gonna choose not zero, not one, but two. This one, the multiplex is a mux, a multiplexer. This multiplexer is gonna get as his input two bits. There's two lines here, you know, it's K lines. He wrote K here, it's K lines, which is in our case two. That's a pretty bad two, but that's a two coming in here. And of the two, it's either one, it's gonna be one zero, it's gonna choose line number two, the byte that this piece of memory stuck out 
is going to come down through and come out. So now I've used all 32 bits to select the one, but I divided it up. I used the first 30 bits, 30 uh, input line, 30 bits, yeah, to select which memory I want, but it's a memory on all the different units of memory. And then I use a multiplexer to, to let only one come out. So that's great. Now I've, what have I, what is my cost and what have I saved? I've saved, we said already, 3 billion uh, lines of my decoder, which makes it a lot cheaper. And what do I have to spend? I just have to buy one simple multiplexer with only four entrances. You know, multiplexer just by four. Why does that work? Because of the rules of math. I could have 16, you know, I'm sorry, I could have, how, I could have $100 by having $101 bills. That was the one B. But I could say, no, 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 I'm going to have five $20 bills. So now each of them at 20 is smaller than 100 and five is smaller than 100. But the multiplication of them together is essentially multiplying. I have this and I'm multiplying it by these four possibilities over here. So obviously the idea, the shortest, assuming that decode, I mean, here's a question. Assuming that a decoder costs the same as a multiplexer, what would be the ideal way to save money? Or save logic, however you want to think about it. Assuming that, they, that they're equally difficult to create, what would be the ideal ratio for J and K? Put it another way, if I want to have the fewest possible bills in my pocket, and I, I can't have, a, I want to have $100. There are no $100 bills, though. But I want to have the fewest number of bills. Well, actually, that's confusing. No, that's a bad example. Um, anyway, assuming that they're the same price to build in cost in terms of dollars or in terms of logic gates, the, the most ideal distribution between J and K would be 50-50. In other words, if I want to get to 16, the best way to get there is by four times four. I could do eight times two and get to 16, but eight times two means I'll have to have one that's eight. Eight and eight and two is 10. But if I do four times four, it's only four and four is eight. That's the cheapest way to get there. If I want to get to 100, the best way is 10 times 10. I have 10 of these and 10 of those. That'll give me a total of 20 things. I could do 50 and two, but then I have 52 things. It's a lot more expensive. So the ideal ratio would be half here and half here. I did it differently because it's harder to, because it's easier to draw this way. Okay. Um, let's, is that clear? You guys still awake? I'm awake. Yeah, good. Okay. So um, that's a big advantage. We just now have a very big thing here that we, that should be an interesting, this is, this is the main thing I think of the whole chapter to understand this, that, that we've now saved, you know, we've made a better design of how to get to memory with 2D. Why am I not getting to the next slide? Okay, now here's just an explanation of it. If you want to look that over, you know, he just says, you know, K, S is two to the K, whatever. He just does a little math here, but it's not really, it doesn't really do anything. Um, all right, let's jump to, wait. Ah. Uh, We can say that 2D requires less logic. And he gives an example, fewer logic gates. I, just, I told you the same thing. Okay, goal, enlarge. Now we're talking about how to increase the size of memory that we have. Let's say we want to enlarge the memory by using multiple small memories. So we will see. Methods for two types of memory expansion. First thing we can do is, well, first, our first goal is to increase, there's two different goals we could have. Increase the size of the data while keeping the address space constant. 
In other words, we want to keep the address space is 32 bits. We don't want to make it more than 32 bits, but we want to have more data. Can anybody suggest how we could do that? Just in general sense? How could I have more data and yet have the same address space? I actually mentioned it. By splitting up the J and K 50 50? No, no, that would be by saving logic. Now I'm just talking, now I'm talking about a different question. I want to have more data. I want to have a total amount of more data, but I want to not increase the amount of addresses that I have. We have to go back to um, this picture. How can I have more memory here and not change M? Well, what is the memory size a function of? M and N. If I can't change M, I'll have to change N. So I will keep the memory space, but instead of pumping out eight bits every time, I'll pump out nine bits every time, or a thousand bits every, or you know, usually it'll be a, 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 a multiple of eight. So 16 bits, 32 bits. I can just say every address, you know what? Every address doesn't refer to a byte. It refers to a whole uh, four bytes. It refers to an integer, you know, it refers to four bytes. So every time I give it another address, it comes out a whole nother integer. Zero will be one four set of four bytes. One will be another set of four bytes. Two will be another set of four bytes. So I've got now, I've now, I've now had my memory. I mean, I'm not talking about how I'm building it, but I'm not talking about how the building of it works, but I'm just saying the concept. The concept is I can increase the size of my memory without changing this by simply um, changing my data size. We'll see how to do it. Um, the second possibility is increase the number of addresses while keeping the data size constant. What if I want to increase the number of addresses here, but not increase how much data comes, not increase the size of data. I want to still have four gigabytes, but I want to have more addresses here. So obviously I'll be addressing smaller and smaller things. I'll address every, every set of two bits. Then I'll, I won't, I can, I can increase my memory my precision, my memory precision, I can, and yet not have any more data. Um, okay, let's see an example. Here is increase the size of the data, essentially the word length. How can I do that? Well, I don't wanna change without increasing the address. So look what I do. My address was M, my address is still M but I send that address down over here and over here. And this memory here is let's say one gigabyte, or, you know, or it doesn't matter what it is. It's one gigabyte, one gigabyte, whatever. It's actually, if M is 32, then this is four gigabytes and this is four gigabytes. But what am I outputting? Before when I did it, it was just M comes in here and I got two bits came and came out. Now, when I put the same M in here, it's going to go to this unit and this unit. I'm going to get eight bits coming out. And if I view, sorry, not eight, four bits coming out. It was two, and now it's another two of four bits coming out. And when I view this output as one single thing, it's as though I'm looking at four bits. This, you know, if I have the number, you know, zero, zero, one, one, it'll be 12. What's the advantage of using two SRAMs as opposed to using just one SRAM that's twice as big? Um, because this S, oh, because then if I use one that was twice as big, then the memory would be larger. Then the M would be not M, but it would be M plus one. Again, right? This is so we don't need to change the address from a 32 bit. Right. We're leaving it 32 bit and we're just and we and we're just going to get more data out. Essentially, you can think about it like this. Like you can think about it like it is uh, one data, because really what I have is like this. Uh, just a second. Yeah. You know, I have a big black box all around the whole thing. Sorry for my drawing. And 
M goes in, and I don't know what's going on inside. Inside, M is getting divided and sent to two places. All I know is I stick in M, and I get four bits of data on the outside. How We're explaining how it works inside, how it could work inside. Could work with one like this, where I, where, where I take, I, I buy two pieces of memory that are, well, this is not four gigabytes, actually. It's four gigabytes of addresses. It's sorry, it's four billion, it's four gigabytes, to, but it's only two bits. So it's not, it's four, it's four billion addresses, but only of two bits. So how many bytes is it? It's four billion divided by four. So it's one gigabyte. This is one gigabyte, this is one gigabyte. And I have a gigabyte of addresses and I get out of it two. Wait, why, why is it only one gigabyte? Because if this was 32, if M was 32 and this was producing a byte, th M to the 32 is a giga. So it'd be a giga byte. But this is not producing a byte, it's only producing two bits. Two bits is a quarter of a byte. So it's so it's not four, if it would have been four gigabytes, now it's gonna be one gigabyte. A quarter of four, it's one. Because I'm not, what's coming out here is not a byte. This is four giga, quarter bytes this is four giga quarter bytes so if i ask how many bytes is it it's only one gigabyte of memory but what the output is still two okay whatever it's just uh akiva yes yeah. sorry i don't know what just did that yeah that's funny okay um we will create a data with size four by combining two of the previous memory units. Again, you can get memory of all different types. And now if we want a particular thing, we'll put in this. Now we still have to say chip, we have to decide. This will be our, our lines in to the black box. Chip, so, ah, we have to choose which chip select though. Um, ah, so we're gonna choose both. Look, our chip select says, we wanna choose this one. So we're gonna activate also here and also here. We wanna read, so we're gonna do, Output enable also here and also here. And we're going to get all four bits. Yofi, let's see the next slide. It looks like you can't do one of them though, right? It's always going to be both. Yes, exactly. You'll always, you've now created a black box of four bytes. Oh, sorry, four bits of data with the same M memory. Okay, um, expand memory by expanding the address space. The data will remain two bits. Now we're doing the opposite. We're gonna leave the data as coming out as two bits, but we wanna expand the address space by four and still have a two bit data. So the new size will be two to the M times four, times two, two bits, two to the M, but we wanna have four times as much, so times four, and it's still two bits. So the way we get the times four is it's like two to the M plus two. That's times four, two to the two squared. So the plus two is two more bits. This means we need to add two bits to the address. In the following diagram, we're gonna omit the WE and the OE, but in reality, they'll be there. We're just gonna leave them out. Since the memory output D182 are TS, we are allowed to connect them. Let's see, what, let's see what's going on here. Ah, so, here, what we do is we say like this. We say, um, here's our original memory, M, A zero until A at location M minus one. That's our original. And he goes in here and he hits these uh, this SRAM. And again, this SRAM has only got 32 bits, for example. 32, 32, 32. And we choose one of them. But we choose one here, we choose one here, we choose one here, we choose one here. 
And now the output is going to go here, and this is like a bus here with the TS on it or something. Um, we connect them, and it comes out here. But which one of them will be? You know, there's, there's TSs in here. That's what I was saying before. Inside of here, there's TSs. So when we say chip select on only one of them, see, that's what this is coming out here. Only one, each one of these has its own chipset, which is a different number here. So if we select this one, then all the other ones will have this line severed and this line severed. It won't be connected because there'll be, uh, that's what this chip select means. It means put a disconnect over here and over here if it's off. So if I selected only this one, then again, he's on the highway by himself. His data comes running out and goes out there. And his other data comes running out and comes out over here. And the two bits are coming from him. Sometimes this one will have a chip select. Sometimes this one will have a chip select. Whichever one is selected, his data will come out. Now, how do I select? Well, I increase the size of my memory. And I have my addresses. Instead of being 32, it's going to be 34, where the two most significant ones are tacked on at the end. And they're going to be either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Four possibilities. Those two bits come in here, and one is a decoder, and one of those will get lit. And the one that gets lit, he'll be the one to send the data. It should be obvious. Now let's see a question. Assuming M is 8, not 32. I did it with 32. This was 32. Assuming M is 8, that means it's a total of 10. So assuming M is eight, what is the address space for each memory unit in the previous slide? Now, it's not clear exactly what I mean by this. What is the address space of each memory unit in the previous slide? So the answer is like this. Uh, and then you'll see what the question was. The address space for this guy is from zero. Oh, oh, sorry. Is, the address space of this guy is from zero. In the, from zero, all of these being zero. Until what? Until all of these being one, but these two remaining zero, because the minute this changes to zero one, then I'm on this, this, this guy. So the address space for this guy is from zero until, uh, you want to say something, Yitz? Seven? You had a question? I'm, I'm, it's until seven? 7.30. And it's no, no. Oh, I meant, from zero to seven bits. Zero to seven, exactly. And this is eight and nine. So let's so let's write it all out. The two most significant bits I read on the left, zero, zero, here. I just want to finish this lecture today, so let me just finish it. You guys can wait another five minutes. We're almost done. Um, it'll be all ones in these eight bits, so that's that's four. I got to do three more. True four. Well, whatever. Undo that. Did I do control Z? Everyone sees that? It's the address space of this guy is from everything being zero, he's the first one, from everything being zero until everything being one, but these two remaining zero. So it's from zero until whatever number this is, you know, this is a, some number. What's the address of this guy? Well, it's it's from this, it's from, it's from, it's not from zero anymore. It's from zero one. Remember his most significant bit is it's zero one over here. And now it's from that all zeros, a lot of zeros here. Uh, how many? Eight. That's three, four, plus another. Four. Who's this? This is SRAM two. This is all SRAM, yeah. And I'm saying this is SRAM two that you're talking about now, or this is still one. Oh, two D. You're saying this is yeah. a new topic. This is not related to the. This is no, no, uh, no. I'm saying the. I'm saying this is all, what, what, what is the second set of numbers that you're showing now? The range of addresses that, that 
the range of addresses in here that refer to this one. There's a the range of addresses in here is from zero until ten ones. But not all of them refer to this guy. Some of those refer to this guy, and some of them refer to this guy, and some to this guy. So the question was, what is the range of addresses over here that refer exclusively to this block of memory? So the answer is from zero until zero zero one 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 one. Because these have to be zeros. And the addresses over here, this is a 10-bit address. This is a 10-bit address. This is 10 zeros, really. Is a 10-bit address is from this address until which address? Well, we keep the zero, zero one, 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 one. Exactly. Zero one. And then followed by, you know, seven, uh, sorry, eight ones. Eight ones. And the same thing for this one. This will be, this one will be one zero, 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 zero until one zero, uh, one, 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 one. And this will be one, one with eight zeros until one, one with eight ones. That's all the question was, just to make you, to force you to understand what this, how this maps to this. Okay. No, oh, I gotta go like this. Oh. Hmm. Eraser. So we're done or we're, we stop to do more? Wait, let me just do a little bit more. I just want to erase this so that you don't get confused here. Yeah, uh, basically, if you have to go, you can go and I'll just explain it and I'll post it. But um, second. So I just explained what I did here. Here, here it's all written out. It's the same thing. This is the first one is zero zero, and then all these can change. And the second one is zero one, and all these can change. That's just explaining. Now, properties of DRAM, I'm just going to talk in, in general about DRAM. DRAM is large, larger storage space relative to SRAM. It uses 2D memory organization. It uses that 2D that we learned. To say, look at the save space. It's much cheaper than SRAM. It's a slow access time compared to SRAM. SRAM is whatever. These numbers tell you how fast it is. There's also DDR4, which is a kind of DRAM, which is faster. The same, pretty much, as SRAM. It's like a new version of D. In other words, they're trying to make the cheap stuff work as fast as the SRAM. So if it does, then you may as well buy the cheap stuff. After a certain time, if we don't take any preventative measures, the data will be lost. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the next slide, which is how what the preventative measures are. Why is information likely to be lost in DRAM? Information in each cell is stored in a capacitor. All capacitors leak current. Now, they're not perfect vacuums. They're not perfect stores of current. In time, the charge in the capacitor will degrade to a point where we can no longer distinguish between a one and a zero. In other words, the value will become like 0.8. You know. How can we maintain the charge? The storage cell in a memory chip are laid out in rectangular arrays of rows and columns. The read process in a DRAM is destructive and removes the charge on the memory cell. This is what I said, in an entire row. So not, ah, not just in the particular memory that I read, but in the whole row. So there is a row of specialized latches on the chip called sense amplifiers, one for each column of memory cells to temporarily hold the data and then to rewrite the data to the access row before sending the data uh before sending the bit from a single column to output so basically there's a sense amplifier which sort of receives the data and then rewrites it back it amplifies the electricity it rewrites it back into the dram and then sends the data onto where we should go and this is the last slide 
This means the normal read electronics on a chip can refresh um, an entire row of memory in parallel. That's good. It'll refresh that whole row. But normal memory accesses cannot be relied on to hit all the rows within the necessary time instead of stating it. In other words, theoretically, if we would just read the data all the time, read every single piece of data or every row, at least some one thing on each row, <clears throat> then everything would get refreshed all the time. But it could be that certain rows we just never read. So therefore, we have to have a special refresh process. To maintain the charge, we have an external circuitry periodically read and write all the data in the memory, thus, thus bringing the charges back to their level. So basically, we just have, we sort of go through a round robin and read and write every single piece of data periodically so that it doesn't get lost. Um, each memory refresh cycle refreshes the succeeding area of memory cells, thus repeatedly refreshing all the cells in consecutive cycles. So each time we read, each memory refresh, we, 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 every time we read, we're gonna refresh. The process is conducted automatically in the background by the memory circuitry and is transparent to the user. As you don't notice it, but it's going on all the time. While a refresh cycle is occurring, the memory is not available for normal read operations. When this refresh is going, you can't do any read or write. But in my, so this is sort of overhead. There's certain times when you have dead time and you can't use this certain line. You may ask for a certain line of memory and it's just in the middle of a write or a read from this, so you have to wait. It says, but in modern memory, this overhead time is not large enough to significantly slow down memory operation. Which is a little bit surprising to me because the whole point was that it's slower, but it's saying now this overhead is, was about, based on what I've read, this is what I found. This overhead is not so significant. But in general, there is this, but, but there is this need, every time I read a data, I got to write it back. So that's for sure going to slow me down every single time. The, the, the background task of refreshing is not going to slow me down. But the rewriting of the data every time I read from it is going to take a little bit of time. All right, that's chapter 10. Um, and the next chapter is going to be this memory. Next, we're going to talk about cache. And that's going to be after she grew up. So hug some air. Sure. Hug some air, everybody. Hug some air. Hug some air.